Today I'm going to, today will be the starting point, if you will, for a few sermons that I will be preaching over the next uh, couple of weeks. I've been working on some of these sermons for a few months, some of which um, I've uh, started recently working on, but they're coming together so well that I've decided to put them together. We had conversation last Lord's Day about a need with the uh, situation that had happened in Paris to discuss what the Bible has to say about uh, the, uh, the religion or the faith, if you will, that is known as Muslim or Islam. And there's plenty that the Bible has to say about that, and there's plenty that it has to say about the Bible. Also, um, on request, I have been given a letter that I have been working on for quite some time <coughs> involving the um, uh, thoughts that were posted and put out there on the social uh, internet, if you will, uh, concerning Catholicism. And it was, just a, it was just a long letter. It says, a, a letter from a Catholic to the world. And um, I've looked at it and I've taken their points and weighed their points against the Word of God. I'd like to bring that sermon to you as well. And then another one concerning uh, some uh, conversation that I've had very recently concerning an idea that is very um, ingrained in this area, uh, Calvinism, and we would like to talk about that. So probably the next three sermons will be dealing with Islam and what the Bible says, um, Catholicism and what the Bible says, and Calvinism and what the Bible says. And we'll look at it lovingly, we'll look at it educationally, and we'll, as always, take a Christian approach. Today, I want to talk about standing. It is something that most of us take for granted in this world. It is something that many of us do without thinking about it. I am not consciously thinking about standing right now as I deliver this lesson to you. I am just merely standing. The brain kind of takes over. There's, there's chemicals and there's electrical synapses and such that happen that I have nothing and know nothing about. But it just happens and it allows me to do this without not having to constantly and consistently, okay, better stand or I'm going to fall, better stand or I'm going to fall. I go into a more active thought process and this becomes a secondary thing like breathing and heartbeat, which is which are all things that your body does, but you don't sit there and think about, oh, I need to breathe now, or oh, I need to make sure my heart's beating. A few years ago, a young man was asked by his hometown community to deliver a Veterans Day speech. The town had come together and they had their typical Veterans Day parade and their typical Veterans Day festivities, which uh, always concluded with fireworks, and then they would have uh, a member of the community, typically a veteran, stand up and deliver a keynote speech. The unique or interesting thing about this young man as he was selected is that he had participated in several military battles and um, attacks and such in Afghanistan. And he had been involved in a, uh, an act of war where an improvised explosive device, which is too long to say on the TV, so we, we, we break it down to IED, detonated nearby him and his group and he lost both of his legs in the explosion and the surgeries, and he had had several surgeries to uh, keep everything intact and maintain things. But in the process, he had lost both of his legs. Not the use of, he had lost both of his legs. And as the festivities were drawing to a close, they, this town, they came to the community center, and they were asked to 
stand for the Pledge of Allegiance, and the uh, group did. And this young man then came forward in his wheelchair to deliver his keynote speech. And to the start of it, gripped me when I heard this. He said, I still stand for the flag in which I can no longer stand for. And that's a very interesting use of the definition of that word. Merriam-Webster defines stand as a verb to have or maintain an upright position supported by one's feet in, an, in a vertical position to stand. Used as a noun, it is an attitude toward a particular issue, a position taken usually in debate or argument to take a stand. And the gentleman's opening line or opening remark was, my attitude is still devoted toward a thing that I have given my ability to maintain an upright position in. And I love that thought. I have heard other veterans say to those who would protest the American flag, the, uh, the ability or the right, if you will, to participate in open prayer, uh, to those who would uh, debate our freedoms for religion, our freedoms for the right to bear arms, our freedoms for assembling, our freedoms for free speech. And those that enjoy their freedoms more than they, in, they allow us to have our freedoms want to take those freedoms away from us. And I heard a veteran one time say, I will gladly go and fight and possibly die to give you the right to refuse to do that which I go and fight and possibly die for. But I want to look at it in a Christian sense. Because there is a criticism in the world today by Christians that we have handed our freedoms over to those who would take our freedoms from us and possibly our health, our welfare, and our lives by not choosing to stand for Christianity, by passively allowing those forces to come in and take our freedoms from us by force if necessary. And there are plenty in the world today of those who are opposed to Christian values and Christian beliefs. And those values, beliefs, and doctrine that you will find in the Almighty Word of God. Or the Word of the Almighty God. They will gladly come and take those freedoms away from you by force if necessary. And sometimes they enjoy the force. Because they have seen historically Christians stand for that which they can no longer stand for. People have been martyred and butchered and massacred over the millennia because they stand for the Word of Almighty God. They stand for Jesus as the Christ the Savior of mankind. They stand for God Almighty and His omnipotence, His omniscience, and His omnipresence. And those that would be opposed would destroy their health, their welfare, and their life. And yet those that would be opposed to us still see us stand 
almost 2,000 years later. With what seems to be at times the entire world against us. I want to talk about your ability to stand for, for Christianity in a few senses. Acts chapter 17, verse 22. In Acts chapter 20, uh, 17 and verse 22, we have a very interesting um, situation. The Apostle Paul has made a missionary journey. This will be his second missionary journey that places him in Athens, Greece among all of the learned philosophers of the day. And as he's standing among, or as he's a with, if you will, these intimidating men of knowledge who will determine if they hear him or not as you would read this. And I, I do uh, challenge you or I do encourage you, if you will, to read Acts chapter 17, verse 22, 31 on your own. It is a very wonderful account of a Christian standing for Christ. But the main thing that I want to talk about is among these men of knowledge, these intimidating men who would belittle Paul, who would bully Paul, and who would make fun of him and the God that he believes in, I want you to read that very first verse. Then Paul stood in the middle of the Areopagus and said, Men of Athens, I perceive in all things that you're very religious. For as I was passing through and considering the objects for your worship, I even found an altar with this inscription to the unknown God. Therefore, the one whom you worship without knowing him now I proclaim to you. Paul stood on his feet, but Paul affirmed with his heart a love for the undying living God. And through that sermon, he will preach unto them Jesus. And through that sermon, there will be those that believe that day. Here we find the Apostle Paul standing in front of some of the greatest men of that day. Now he could have bent to their worldly knowledge. He could have left them alone. There was nothing pushing him up Mars Hill except his love for the Gospel of Jesus Christ. There was nothing keeping him from deciding, you know, Athens is kind of settled as it is. I'll just go a little bit south and I'll avoid Athens altogether. He did not even have to stop in the city, yet he chose so for the love of the gospel of Christ and the direction of the Holy Spirit. But he stood, nonetheless. He stood on his feet. And he stood for the truth. So a Christian stands for Christ. But more so, a Christian stands with Christ. Matthew chapter 18 and verse 20. Know this, that wherever two or three are gathered together in my name, saith the Lord, I am am there in the midst of them. I am with you, saith the Lord. One of the most beautiful things that our God has told us and has promised us through the ages, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Can I make a, a suggestion? Can I make a challenge? Return the favor. How many times has it seemed that the world was closing in on you? How many times, as it would talk about, as Paul would talk about of those who are to face the judgment, that those men, those, those great men, and leaders and kings and governors would say, mountains fall upon us. How many times has it felt like the mountains have fallen upon you and yet through your faith and your loving God, 
He has shown you a way through some of the darkest paths that you ever have to walk in this world. Now, He does not ask you to build golden idols to Him. He does not ask you to build temples of ivory for Him. All He asks of you is to live for Him. For He died for you. What has encompassed us as Christians? Anger against us? Apathy toward us? Aggression? There are those that work steadily and diligently to destroy the church of Christ. They've attempted through these subversive plots to eradicate the influence of Christ from all of the world. You cannot turn on your television set past 8 p.m. and not hear something in some way that blasphemes the Word of God or ridicules God or ridicules Christ or ridicules His followers, the church. And those who would laugh at you because you follow antiquated, cunningly devised fables as Peter would say in his second epistle to the churches. Those that would make fun of you and ridicule you because you believe in an antiquated fairy tale book that is no more power to them than, say, Pinocchio or one of the, uh, one of the Hans Christian Andersen tales or one of Aesop's fables. To them, this carries no weight and no significance. To us, our entire lives are shaped, revolve around, and are driven by the words contained in this book. What will you stand for? Will you allow them to come in through their plots and eradicate Christianity from this earth? No, we won't. You know, I can see it in your eyes. No, you won't. Because wherever two or three are gathered in His name, hello, two or three. It's good to have you with us this afternoon. He is here in the midst of us. Does that not make you all struck? To know that we stand and our worship today is before the living God. Think about it. Take your time. Our God is not made of stone <clears throat> or ivory. Our God is not made of wood and is not unaccessible on some mountain. But even in the spiritual world that is so far removed from us that we cannot obtain it in the flesh, He is here with us. Consider that in the trials of Peter and John at the first of the, books of, of the book of Acts, the the history of the church through the works of the apostles in the church. As they stood trial and as they were beaten on many occasions for their love and devotion uh, to Jesus Christ, <coughs> they considered it worthy to bear the marks and to suffer the shame for His name's sake. And then beautifully, they continued to preach and teach Jesus through their days in every place. A Christian stands for Christ. A Christian stands with Christ. A Christian stands for truth. Acts chapter 1, verse 15. And in those days, Peter stood up in the midst of the disciples 
Acts chapter 2 and verse 14. And Peter, standing with the eleven, raised his voice and said, Men of Judea, Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be made known to you. Acts chapter 4, verse 5. And it came to pass on the next day that the elders and the rulers and the scribes as well as Annas the high priest and Caiaphas, John and Alexander, and many as well of the family of the high priest were gathered together in Jerusalem, verse 12. And when they had set Peter uh, uh, in trial, him standing in the midst said, By what power or what by, my, by what means have you done this, Peter? Peter was standing... But Peter was standing for the truth. Knowing it would cost him his flesh. Knowing it would cost him his credibility with that much learned society. Peter stood for the truth. And eventually, as history would record, it finally cost him his life. A Christian stands <coughs> against error. In standing for truth, we need to also remember that we must take a stand against error and false teaching. We cannot allow it into the church. We cannot allow it to stain the Garments of the bride of Christ. We cannot allow it to creep into the congregations and we cannot allow it to come from the congregations. We need to consistently and constantly search the Word of God to determine what is and what isn't and cling and hold fast to what is and shun and reject what isn't the Word of God in truth. Several years ago, there was a country singer, and those several years are turning into several teen years. Have you realized that? Time doesn't slow down. We're not getting younger, we're getting older. And what used to be, oh, a few years ago, this fellow sang, and several years ago, this fellow sang, and I'm thinking almost 15 years ago, somewhere in that neighborhood, this fellow sang a country song, and the title of it was very well put. You have to stand for something or you'll fall for anything. And there just has to come a time, Christian, that passivity is not enough. Now, I'm not calling for a rally cry like some of those opposed to us that you go out and sacrifice your flesh. But defend the Word of God, people. Don't open the door for the devil and let him walk right on in. Keep the door locked. We are in a spiritual war. Now, we will talk next week and following about those that will tell their believers that you must pay in flesh for your faith. I'm not telling you to pay in flesh for your faith, although there have been thousands and scores of Christians who have for their faith over the ages. I'm telling you we are in a spiritual warfare against principalities and powers of evil and darkness, and they would pleasure in removing truth from the world. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 3 and 4. As I urged you when I went into Macedonia, remain in Ephesus and you may charge some that they teach no other doctrine nor give heed to fables and endless genealogies which cause disputes rather than godly edification which is in faith. Just one of those personal side moments. Have you ever had someone just come up and bring you a biblical discussion just to stir things up? 
just because they know it will cause dissension, just because they know it will create trouble. They're using the Word of God against you, it seems. Feel unique? The devil did the same to Jesus Christ. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 and 2. Now, the Spirit expressly says that in latter times, welcome to latter times, that the Spirit says that in latter times some will depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons, speaking lies and hypocrisies, having their own conscience seared with a hot iron. I was told just recently this week when confronted with a sinful situation that I didn't have an open enough mind. And I said, no, I do have an open mind and I see the truth and you do not have an open heart. But yours is closed and cold and sad. How do we treat those that would bring destructive heresies into the church? 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 3 and 5, Paul gives Timothy instruction. If anyone teaches otherwise, that is, against truth, and does not consent to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and to the doctrine which accords to godliness, he is proud, knowing nothing but is obsessed with disputes and arguments for over words, from which calls envy and strife, reviling suspicions, useless wranglings of men of corrupt minds, destitute of truth, who support God, who suppose that godliness is a means of gains. And here is your charge, Timothy. From such withdraw yourself. Paul gives instruction to Timothy that we as the church by application can take on how to stand against error and against false doctrine and for truth. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 13 and 14. Hold fast the pattern of sound words which you have heard from me and in faith and in love from which from Christ Jesus. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1. Therefore you, my son, be strong in grace which was given that Christ Jesus and the things that you have heard from among many witnesses and commit these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 15. Study to show yourself approved. The more appropriate Greek translation, be diligent in studying to show yourself approved. And finally, 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 2-5. through 5. Preach the Word. Be ready in season and out of season. Convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching. For there will come a time that some will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, keep upon themselves false teachers. But you be watchful in all things, and afflictions endure and do the work of an evangelist and fulfill your ministry. Finally, we must stand on the rock. Matthew chapter 16, verses 15 and 18. And he said to them, Who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered and said, You are Christ the Son of the living God. Jesus answered and said, Flesh and blood, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood have not revealed this to you, but my Father which is in heaven. But I also say that you are Peter, and on this rock, that confession, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. So where do you stand? What's important to you? What? really matters when it matters most. We stand in awe of the presence of Jesus the Nazarene. And we wonder how He could love me 
a sinner condemned unclean. As we sing, oh how wonderful, oh how marvelous, and my song shall ever be, oh how wonderful, oh how marvelous is my love. If you need to become a Christian, if you need to obey the gospel of Christ, these words that we preach, if you need to rededicate yourself and firming yourself on the rock by which you stand, now is the time. There is not a promise of the next moment. There's not a promise of the next second. Everything that you will one day stand in judgment on, where every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess, be prepared and be ready and by all means stand. If you have need to obey the gospel, prayers for whatever reason or need you have, by all means come forward as the other stand and sing the song of the